Um, thank you very much for staying this late on a Friday afternoon uh, to listen to me. Um, I, I actually appear naked before you. I know less about education than uh, many of you in this room, all of you probably. Um, although in the last two weeks I've sort of picked up a bit. I went, in the games industry we have a charity called Games Aid and uh, we put some money, we put a million quid into um, uh, one of those academy schools. This one was in Paddington. And that opened yesterday, and we all went along, and it was amazing. Uh, there's some complex means by which if you can raise uh, money from the public sector, it releases lots more from the state sector. And uh, so this incredible school was shown to us, and uh, Princess Anne came along and opened it, and it was beautiful, and had the most extraordinary resources. Uh, and that was very nice. Two weeks before, I, um, I went to my first sort of grown-up secondary school PTA meeting. Um, uh, and that really quickened the pulse much more, I have to tell you. This is a small secondary school in Somerset, uh, where my daughter is now studying. And that was an amazing evening. And I'll tell you some more about that in a, in a second. Um, why I think I've been invited is uh, when Derek was presenting first thing, not first thing, but midway through the morning, he, he sort of talked about the school's domain and then the game domain. I come from the game domain. I know about games. Uh, I can tell you a bit about games and what's been happening in games recently and what's going to happen in the future. Other speakers have touched on this. Ian touched on this um, uh, a bit and uh, Graham touched on it this afternoon. But I'll, I'll sort of give you some numbers around it. You don't have to write it down because I'm going to give it all to Graham um, and he will um, put it up and you can have it later. So don't, don't worry that you're going to miss anything. Why you should believe me is this stuff behind me. We run huge syndicated research um, thing for all the games publishers, or all the big ones, um, and they all use it for their planning. And then I personally have been running a sort of company that uh, looks at individual games and tries to make them better and help people engage with them even more, and perhaps most importantly want to buy them, and uh, I've done about 250 games that way in the last 12 years. Um, before that, as, as uh, Graham said, I was... Uh, um, I was a sort of failed filmmaker, pretty lousy soap opera writer, and a charging member of the European Commission. I had a great time uh, spending other people's money. Okay, uh, the market now. Um, the whole market in the UK, so all the people over the age of six who breathe, that's, they're just alive at all, um, 55.3 million in the UK. Um, active gamers, now our definition of active gamers is people who've bought a game in the last 12 months uh, or had it bought for them. If you're under sort of 14, 15, it doesn't tend to be your money, it tends to be someone else's money, but it was you that wanted it. So all the people that's happened to in the UK in the last 12 months is 16.7 um, million. That's a lot of people. Um, I'll show you which people they are in a second, but that's an awful lot of people, you know. All the people who've been to a theatre in the last 12 months is probably, I don't know, 2% of the population, 3% of the population. All the people who've been to a film is maybe 20%. This is um, huge. Now, that's not all of them. There's some people who tried it, liked it, but have stopped. In fact, the whole gaming industry keeps losing people. Lots and lots of people start young, and then they sort of drift away. There's more important things for them to be doing. Um, so lapsed gamers... 5.6. And then there's this last category, non-buying gamers. They, get, they game, they play all sorts of different games, but they never actually get around to paying for anything. So that's uh, 3.8 million. I know, they're infuriating if you're, if you're from the commercial side. I look out at an audience of educationalists, and, and you see me, and I'm from the sort of business side of the games industry, and worse than that, the marketing side of the games industry. And uh, I don't know what you think. I'm Darth Vader in a cheap suit. That's what I am. I'm just evil. Anyway... Of this lot, PlayStation 2, sort of old console now, but still actively used. People have bought a game for it. 4.5 million people still active on that. 3.9 on the PC. That market has really, really been diminishing recently. Um, we heard a lot about World of Warcraft, and I'll close with a few wo words about World of Warcraft that will paint it in a more positive light than what you heard earlier. Um, but... Um, that has been propping up the PC market for quite a while in terms of games that people buy. Games that people play for free, yeah, it's, it's huge, obviously. But in terms of buying, it's relatively small. GB is Game Boy, almost gone now. Um, PSP is the handheld controller for, the, uh, for uh, the Sony company, PlayStation sort of handheld thing. Two million of those are active in the UK. 
DS, the one that Derek was talking about, them using a lot in Scotland, that's the Nintendo product, 5.8 million active users. Um, Xbox 360, 2.3, PS3, 2 million, and the Wii, 6.1 million Wii users in the UK at the moment. So that's who's doing it. Now, this is looking at them by age, okay? The bright, terrifying green sort of thing, those are non-gamers, okay? The ages go 6 through 9 is the first bar, the, last, the very last bar is the whole market, but the um, last bar on the extreme right-hand side is 55 plus. And as you can see, the most non-gamers are in the sort of 55 plus section. Six through nine, ten, the two different colors, blue for boys, pink for girls. I know, it's just obvious, isn't it? Um, and you will see it dip away quite quickly. Um, sort of 15 through 19, it dips quite fast. 20 through 24, which is here, he's nearly walking off the back of the stage, that one there, that's sort of holding, and then it really starts to fall away as they get older. In fact, it used to fall away completely, but it doesn't now. Um, a lot of the games, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some of them in a second, but a lot of the games are um, targeting that market now. There's never, not in the five years that we've had this tracking, been much room for expanding the sort of, um, let's say, 8 through 14-year-old market. That's been pretty saturated. 90%, something like 90% of kids at that age in the UK are naturally gamers. Um, where the change has been recently is later than that. Um, it's people older than that. And in fact, what it used to be was boys would hang on for a bit and girls would just stop at the age of 14, never game again. But what, what is happening now is principally due to software and in some ways due to the, the Nintendo hardware, that is, those markets have expanded. Now, if I show you this not sort of by 100%, by the, by the actual total millions in the UK, those are the actual total millions. And now the last bar isn't the total. That that's last bar is just the people who are 55 plus. So there you see the size, the green bars are the size of the people that we have yet to really reach or are not reaching in the last 12 months with our products from the games industry. Um, so going forwards, a lot of people are thinking, if you want to sell games, you're going to want to try and come up with games that are better for older people. Uh, and so that's what people are doing. The reason this jumps madly from, from here to here is because that says 30 to 34 and that says 35 to 44. So that's twice as many people. It's just we don't really count them so well because they don't spend as much money on games. But that's twice as many people. This slight bulge, that's the sort of baby boomer bulge. Um, and as I said, the green is the, the potential. That's, they're the people we still want to reach. Now these are the different platforms by, by sex again you will see that the um, Xbox and the PS3 are about a quarter female, three quarters male. Whereas the DS is actually more female than male, and the Wii is pretty much a 50-50 split. Um, the PSP repeats the same pattern, much more male than female. Okay? So, in terms of a split between sexes, Nintendo seems to be getting it uh, much more balanced. This is uh, the same consoles, but what I'm looking at here is the age. And the thing to look at here are these two. PS3, which was the most recently released Sony product, this one here. And Xbox 360, the most recent Microsoft product. The two big age bands there are 15 to 19 and 20 to 24. They, they hold up about a third, more than a third of their marketplace. Whereas the others... The competing product from um, Nintendo, the Wii here, they kind of kissed goodbye to that market. They weren't too worried about that market. And they went much more widely for the markets actually on either side, both the younger market and the older market. I'll show you which products work for those later. Okay. Um, you, we talk about casual, we talk about sort of hardcore games. Actually, most people use those as a description of the type of content. <laughs> They think of Grand Theft Auto as a hardcore game, and they think of, um, I don't know, Wii Tennis as a, um, a sort of casual type game. We do it slightly differently. We, we, we look at it, how many games have you bought, and how much, um, how much time have you spent gaming? And we add those two together, and we come up with a definition that is um, like this. So this isn't the type of games they're playing. This is how much money and how much time they devote to gaming. The actual definition is on the right-hand side, which you can have later. 
The point I want to make here is that the, um, the bottom, the sort of thick red stuff at the bottom, those are the hardcore gamers. Now that, when the new consoles were all released about a year and a half ago, two years ago, that everybody was gaming much, much harder. The people who were gaming were spending, devoting more of their time and spending more of their money gaming. That, however, disappeared much more quickly than it normally does and has swung round to allow, and these are these figures at the end here, these are the most recent figures I have, all from 2008. Um, we've got new figures in about three weeks. A huge swelling in the casual market in the last two years. Now, that's very product-led. That's very much due to um, uh, the types of products that have been most successful in the market, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, so, huge swing towards casual. Now, the last thing is hours per week. How do, how, how do people game? Pink line, girls, blue line, boys. So, with the, um, at the extreme left-hand side there, we've got very, very low numbers of hours per week. And then the extreme right, we've got 25 hours or more, much, much higher levels of hours per week. So girls game less, basically. They tend to score sort of one to four. Um, and after that, it tails off, but with boys generally being, uh, spending more of their time gaming. Um, OK. This last thing shows four separate things. The big red bars, you can see, are people playing games on their own, uh, not connected to the internet. The next uh, little um, bar next to it is people playing games with each other, but not connected to the internet. The third one is people playing games on their own, but connected to the internet, so like World of Warcraft would be, or something like that. And then the fourth one is people playing multiplayer games online, so, so the shooting games and the racing games and the things that you now play online to compete with each other. Um, that's what that shows. And here the pattern between men and women is also very different. Um, what you see here is um, that the playing together on their um, not connected to the internet, this set of pink bars here, here, here and here, is much higher for women than it is for men. Women much prefer playing games together. They can't quite see the point in the same way that men do. I mean, there's there's still lots of them playing games on their own, but there's lots more of them playing games together. For, for, for women, the, the whole social, having a laugh, doing Sing Star together, doing um, uh, those sort of games, much more sort of female behavior pattern, much more supported by um, women. Okay. Um, so, I hope you've got from that, you should have done, that the changes recently have been towards more casual stuff, more women, and older. It's, the profile has got considerably older in the last five years. Now, here are the games they play most in the UK. Blue are the ones um, on the left are boys, the ones on the right are girls. The ones marked in blue are only in the top 20 boy titles. They don't appear in the top 20 of their girls' titles. And the ones marked in pink are only in the girls' things. So if you, if you look at them both, you see Wii Sports, which was given away free with the Wii. So, I mean, it's a great game and it deserves to be played a lot, but in fairness, it was given away as part of the package you had to buy when you bought the Wii. So there's going to be a few people try it, but they seem to keep playing it and keep liking it. And I'm sure Wii Sports 2, should it exist, not, it won't be a flop. But if we then look at uh, the second one on the guy's side, if you can't see, and you probably can't, I'll tell you what it is, it's Grand Theft Auto that 41% um, of male British gamers have played that in the last six months. 90% uh, of them are aware of it. Grand Theft Auto is number 14 on the female chart. That is not to ladies' tastes. Um, whereas the third one down on the female chart, um, which is uh, The Sims, that's, um, that is not to men male taste at all. Um, that uh, men don't like The Sims at all. The Sims, if you don't know it, is kind of a digital doll's house where you get to sort of make a family and get them to do the washing up and you have this wonderful, totally controllable world where everybody does exactly what he says. Perfect. Just like family life. Um, and for some reason that appeals to women. Um, it, and, and so it continues. The two blue ones in the bar on the uh, left-hand side, which are the male games, uh, that don't appear on the female side, no big surprise there. One's called FIFA, one's called Pro Evo. They are two football games and, uh, and very much loved. Now, if we go to the next one, these are the ones they enjoy the most, because we, we don't only ask them what they're playing, but get them to score out of 10 how much they enjoy them. You've only got four that appear on both lists. 
The taste, the difference in taste between female taste and male taste is enormous. Now, if we, we do these by age as well, and you've got inc incredible disparities according to age. So I guess the point I'm working my way towards is games have become, you know, we've started to get much better at picking off our niches. We've got much better at doing games for young people, much better at doing games for women, much better at doing games for older males who, who wear hats in an inappropriate fashion. We, we are just good at, you know, picking off our niches. Um, the one at the top of the mail list is Football Manager, okay? I once did some research for uh, a, uh, a group of people who'd done um, a fantastic exhibition in Docklands, so it was a bit tricky to get to, and they didn't get everyone there they wanted, and they wanted to see where they'd gone wrong, so I did some research, and one of the ideas they came up with was, let's have some huge game competitions there, because they wanted to get an extra 50,000 people together. So we're talking to various people about what would be good ones to have game competitions and FIFA would be good. And then someone said we could do, and he was kind of a, um, an individual, he's kind of inside himself and unshaven, and he trembled a lot. He said we could do um, a football manager game. Uh, we could do that. That would be, you know, we could have like a, a mass competition of football manager players. I said, great, how would that work? Well, you know, like they used to do dances in the 30s where you had to stay awake for four days. Yeah, we could do that with football manager. Just keep playing, keep playing. And that was, that was, that's the level of intensity that game requires to fully enjoy. Um, top of the female chart, we've got We Fit. Now, We Fit is a fantastic game, but basically what you're doing is standing on a bathroom scale, wiggling. <laughs> and, and, and being a brilliant piece of game design, they interpret that wiggle in different ways. So you can wiggle like a yoga wiggle, you can wiggle like you're heading the football. Um, you can, the one I'm good at is wiggling like a skier. Now, I'm, I can't ski. I've no idea how to ski. But I, I, I can apparently wiggle like a skier on bathroom scales. Uh, now, the promise of Wii Fit is, is it's kind of exercise of a sort. Because you, you get off it, you get on it, you, you can wiggle vigorously. Um, and um, that is absolutely top in terms of enjoyment on the, on the, on the female chart. And so it goes down. Um, okay. So what's the next market going to be driven by? Um, well, um, let me show you how we tend to analyze games. We break up, we, we sort of define them. Our, our definition is uh, gamers want to do something that intrigues them in a way that is fun. Now, what our industry calls a way that is fun is, is gameplay. And that's what uh, Ian Livingstone was talking about when he, he, he was pointing at uh, Pong and he was saying it was sort of only 2D and incredibly simple but it was still ga great gameplay and that's what it all comes back to. This uh, way that is fun is, is something we're, we're really, really good at now, or we think we are. Um, and it's, it's, it's the continuing rebalancing of the following elements in the same sequence, okay? Um, you give people a new environment which they have to understand. You then um, give them skills that are appropriate to that environment. You then get them to use those skills, test those skills. When they finally do it right, you tell them that they've done it right. You then give them a reward, and then you tell them that they've got to start again, but in a slightly newer and different environment. Those are the four, six rather parts of gameplay. That's what gameplay is. Um, now, it's kind of, what, what, what does each one of those give us? Because each one of them does seem to work for people. Um, understanding the new environment gives you some sort of surprise, discovery, challenge. Acquiring new skills, learning, preparation, being better at things is a big driver for people. Testing those skills, the sort of, um, the bit where you're repeatedly doing it to try and get it right, is proving self-emotion, focus, proficiency, Completion, you know, you finished. Uh, release, there's a, I'm sure it's endomorphins or something, but there's a burst of pleasure at finishing and getting it right. Conquering, perhaps. Reward, proof of self-worth. Rather than just proving self-worth, this is, once you've been given a reward, that is, that's a reinforcement and so on. Um, you're also, and we'll get back to this, increasingly given something that you want that is not inside the game, necessarily. And then progression, Progression is very, I, I, um, as was mentioned, I, I, I eked out some humble coin in New York for a while writing daytime soap operas. Progression is like daytime soap operas. The whole thing is about cliffhangers and whether you go forwards and whether you go forwards to the right next place and so on. 
But here's the thing that quickened my pulse at the PTA meeting two weeks ago. Um, I, I don't quite know what I was expecting. It's not a particularly well-resourced um, school. Um, my wife was there uh, 20 years ago, and she didn't notice much in the way of changes, other than a few posters. Um, it's, um, we went in, it was all very sort of well-organized, and um, we were taken off by sort of older pupils to meet teachers in different parts of the school and so on. I met two good teachers, two great teachers, and four outstanding teachers. And it was an extraordinary night. But it wasn't, it wasn't just extraordinary because of what I was about to say. But I met, I met utterly committed people who had a, a very complete... I'm like any member of the English middle class. I believe my children are utterly amazing and the only whole thing holding them back is the quality of their teachers. I met amazing teachers. Amazing teachers. Um, who had a real relationship with, with Agnes. Um, had a... Um, uh, were showing me work. I had no idea. I, I, I've watched her do homework and things a couple of times. I had no idea the caliber of the stuff that she was doing. But what they were doing, the language they were using to describe their approach to it, it wasn't, it wasn't perfectly the same, but it was very similar. They were talking about giving her the skills with which to then um, do things and then um, uh, checking, confirming, and setting her off on the next thing. And we were saying, how do you, you know, different standards of people and it's all about doing it in this and the sequence was almost identical the sequence was very very similar now this isn't you know I'm not even the first person to say this today I noticed some of this in what what Derek was saying this morning but it is that it's a very similar sequence that we're into with gaming and it seems to me with the best of uh, the education that I've encountered now, on there, I say they give you something that you want, a bit like We Fit maybe gives you some fitness and some exercise and makes you slightly better. Dr. Kawashima's brain training, which we've heard referred to a lot, might make you a bit better at maths. There's another one called Kawashima's maths training. There's uh, all sorts of language ones now. Um, these aren't designed to be put through schools. These are uh, titles that are being sold you know, in game shops to people who want to play games, but they want an exterior benefit from that, from that thing. They want something other than these thrills. So, um, so I thought, as a mental exercise, I would list kind of all the thrills, all the things you could possibly want. And, and here's the list. Handy list to keep about your person. Everything that everybody wants. And it's coming up slowly. There you go. Right at the top, I've put, because I'm a sort of modest Church of England Buddhist, um, <laughs> enlightenment, um, then love, creativity, belonging. It's interesting, we heard, we saw that thing from the Tavistock Centre about, and I've forgotten the gentleman's name, I'm very sorry, but about um, uh, World of Warcraft and, and how um, uh, addictive it is and, and might lead to certain patterns. Lots of good things, to my mind, are, are very addictive. Uh, I, I discovered the Matchery Auburn novels of Patrick O'Brien uh, three years ago. Some of you might have seen the film Master and Commander. There are 17 more stories like that. I gave up everything. Um, my wife would certainly tell you my sex drive was diminished by those books. I, I just loved them. Um, I changed uh, until I'd finished them. I didn't read anything else. Um, the other thing that the gentleman from the Tavistock Centre didn't quite latch onto, I felt, but it's one of the drivers, key drivers for World of Warcraft, which is a superb game, um, is that it gives these guild structures that, yeah, they, you know, you do have to turn up at certain times. If you're then re-excluded from them, you do feel a very real sense of loss. They give you a massive sense of belonging. Um, uh, you, you belong to a group, and that seems to be quite a primary driver um, amongst these, uh, what, what are called massively multiplayer online games, is this sensation of belonging to a group. There's uh, a very good game um, called Eve, uh, uh, which is done out of Iceland, strangely. And they've done lots of maths and comparisons, because in uh, World of Warcraft, I think the guilds are limited to 60 in size. They've discovered that these guilds can't get more than about 180. 
any larger than 180 people trying to stay in touch with each other over the internet and plan things, it all falls apart. It all disintegrates. But that belonging thing in the middle of it, it's like, you know, it's like why people become Chelsea supporters or why people um, group together for any reason. That belonging thing is a real primary driver. Anyway, the other things on the list, I, what have I got? Beauty and culture, wisdom and knowledge, power and control, individuation and so on. But there's a weird thing about desire. Um, and uh, I was going to say any of you have teenagers, but my daughter is 11, so I haven't really got a teenager yet. But just, you know, just as there's good things that you want, there's kind of, for a period of your life, there's the bad things that you want. There's the opposite side. For each of those goody-goody things, there is an antithesis. Now, these are not things that you're going to want for a long period of time, but there are things that you might want. You might particularly want them in a, in a fantasy world. One of the reasons games are so attractive to people is they, they, they provide a world that follows that circle that I showed you earlier and makes perfect sense. The rules in the games are quite fixed. The, I think it's heuristics, are, are strict and stay the same. Now, for, you know, if you grow up in a happy family and everything's perfect and you've got enough money, okay, you probably don't need that. If there are messy, normal disjuncts in your life where things that you thought were going to happen this way suddenly happen that way, if, you know, any of the nasty surprises that life can throw at you happen to you, then things aren't making sense. And you can find a world that makes sense very attractive, very subsuming, and, and a preferable place, place to be. Anyway, there's the list of everything that everybody wants, some positive, some negative. Um, here's what we sort of targeted first when we started making games. Three, four on the positive side and six on the negative side. Now why on earth would we do that? These are shorter term desires and so on. Why would we go, go, go to the black as it were? Go back to the Darth Vader side of things. Um, don't know. Possibly to do with the fact that they were all being programmed by 23 year old males who ate too much pizza and drank too much Coca-Cola. But we went there. What we've recently discovered with games like um, We Fit, which I mentioned before, and Kawashima and things like that, is we can do these, these other ones. We can do creativity. We can do belonging. We can certainly do, and this is obviously where the crossover with education is most, most obvious, is wisdom and, and knowledge. Um, and that's really been where games have been coming from, and that, that is where games will continue to go. We will move back from the black, we will move firmly into the happy pink, we will um, do games that target these higher things. Now the last point is, is sort of that I put at the top of my list is um, enlightenment. Um, and I'll tell you a little story. The most enlightening thing that happened to me as, uh, after the age of 30, say, was um, I and my wife had a, a very premature child who arrived um, 16 weeks early, so born at 24 weeks, which um, was very much on the cusp of what was possible 10 years ago and uh, wouldn't have worked at all 20 years ago. Um, and the first five weeks after the birth were without a scintilla of a doubt the worst five weeks of my life. Absolutely terrifying. During that period, we started receiving letters at home from all sorts of people, mainly from people we had never heard of. They had heard about our terror, basically, and had decided that they wanted to share compassion and write to us and support us. And we were getting, at one stage, 10 letters a day from random people, which is, until the age, till that period of my life, I think I might have been something of an arrogant prick. Um, you may find it hard to believe, but nonetheless. It may be that the change isn't that obvious, but that utterly... <laughs> I didn't have to laugh that loud. <laughs> that, that, that utterly selfless compassion of just writing a nice remark and being sweet to us in that hour of need made me realise... Well, it took me more towards the Buddhist side of things, let me put it that way. It, 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 it made me realise that... Uh, that human compassion is out there all the time. Cut forwards 10 years, okay? I'm sitting at home, my son is playing World of Warcraft, same son, he's fine. Um, I'm kind of, I research games for a living, so I'm kind of in automatic pilot doing this, 
But I'm also kind of intrigued to see what he's up to. And um, at that stage, it's okay now, but at that stage, we didn't let him play without someone watching, sort of thing. So I say to him, so what happens? How does this work? How do you work out what you're going to do next? How do you get a sense of... And I'm asking all these sort of marketing -y questions about progression and that sort of thing. And he says, well, if I get stuck, I ask for help. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, I just type, help me. Uh, and how does that work? And he said, well, some people are too busy. They just run past. And some people are, you know, rude, if you say that. And they start talking about you being a new boy. But that's only like idiots. 90%, I mean, he didn't say a statistic, but look, most people help you. And he's learned that from World of Warcraft. And I had to learn that from lots of funny letters. So, so that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying about games. That's what I, I want to say about games. Games are extraordinarily powerful. Games will um, definitely be part of the way we go forwards. And just to, just to sort of sum up, the market is getting much larger and is still growing. That's just the things that people pay for. That's before we've taken them into schools and done all the good things we can do with them. Um, it has now reached every demographic, but the greatest potential is amongst the older people. So keep your eyes open for games that are targeted at older people because they'll be coming along next. This cycle of assess, acquire, utilize until correct and then complete and reward and move up has many parallels within educational practice. And gaming is moving towards education at the same time as education seems to be moving towards gaming. And it might even be the case that we're all in the same game. Thank you very much. Thank you.